Hello, guys, and welcome to the Rebound Talks podcast, where you find the best tools, tips, and techniques needed to overcome any adversity. Today, we're going to be speaking with Patrick's James McGinnis. He's a venture capitalist that has invested in two unicorns. He coined the term FOMO, fear of missing out, and FOBO, fear of better options. He's the creator of the hit podcast, FOMO Sapiens, which is distributed by the Harvard Business Review and has achieved over 2 million downloads. He's also an international bestseller with his book, The 10% Entrepreneur. Live your startup dream without quitting your day job. He recently released his new book, FOMO, Practical Decision Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice. In this interview, we're going to be talking about his latest book, the psychological factors behind FOMO and FOBO, some great techniques on how to make better decisions, and how companies have used FOMO and FOBO to drive sales. Stay tuned. Hello, Patrick. Thank you for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, it's my pleasure. I want to start by talking about how you came up with uh, the terms FOMO and FOBO, what they mean, and why we should be taking them more seriously. Yeah, so it, it all started actually when I was right out of college. So I, I graduated from college and moved to New York, and I started working as a venture capitalist. And oh man, it was a time when we had a crisis in the venture capital industry, and like it was a, the, the stocks crashed from the, the Nasdaq fell from five thousand to thirteen hundred. This was all in like two thousand two thousand one, and so like all the companies my firm had invested in went bankrupt, and it was a mess. And then right after that, we had the nine eleven attacks, and I was living in New York City in Lower Manhattan. I saw it with my own eyes. It was just like everything that I thought I knew about the world, about stability, about you know what you're supposed to do, and like everything was was gone. And so I basically started to question everything. And I also thought to myself, like, life is so precious. You, you can't waste any time. And so I wanted to do everything all the time. And so I shortly thereafter got into Harvard Business School and moved up to Boston. And it's a really fun environment. It's what I call a choice rich environment. There's tons of things you can do, whether it's professionally, personally, intellectually, you know, it's just like a nonstop situation. And so I decided that I had to do it all to the point where I actually <laughs> felt stress, right? Like, oh, I can't, you know, I would go to like four parties on a Thursday night and I'd get to the third one and I'd be like, oh my God, what if I don't make the next one? Or, and so I started to realize that I wasn't even enjoying it anymore and that I had this fear of missing out. So I came up with the term, I shortened it to FOMO and I wrote an article in the school newspaper called McGinnis's Two Foes Social Theory at Harvard Business School about FOMO and another term called FOBO, which stands for fear of a better option, which is the idea that we never want to choose anything because we were hoping something better will come along. So those two, uh, I wrote in this article and then they were that was the first time they were used anywhere. And then FOBO didn't get famous, but FOMO did and is now in the dictionary. That that's really amazing. And uh, I read your book, FOMO, amazing, by the way. And you talk about how this uh, wanting to be included, this uh, inclusion is sort of hardwired into our beings, how not being included in something hurts as much as physical pain. So how can this uh, biological factor and social media be fueling all this FOMO. You're absolutely right. So if you think about the biology of FOMO, it's pretty fascinating. Go back to the earliest humans. So we had Homo habilis, Homo erectus. These were the, the very primitive forms of human life in East Africa. And, you know, these people, um, they were very aware of what they needed to survive. And they noticed what they had and didn't have, what somebody else had. And they, they, they were very focused on that. And they also ran in groups, right? They, they didn't want to be excluded from the group because if they were excluded from the group, then something bad could happen to them. And that's exactly what FOMO is. FOMO is about noticing what other people have and, and feeling like we want that. And it's about being afraid of being left out of the group. And so, you know, that's just part of who we are as humans. You fast forward to the times of like Buddha. The reason meditation was, was sort of 
invented, I guess, in, in that time and is because people had all these feelings that are basically the old fashioned version of FOMO and they were living in a proto agrarian society. I mean, this, this is like, you know, early on, right? But they had these feelings, even when lives were much simpler. And then you fast forward to like a hundred years ago, there's, um, you know, the expression keeping up with the Joneses that actually came from a comic strip all about people who were trying to keep up with their neighbors because they had FOMO. And the crazy thing about that is that, you know, my name is Patrick McGinnis. The name of the family that felt all the FOMO was actually the McGinnis family. So <laughs> it's just like I'm related to a bunch of fictional characters who have FOMO. But um, what has what has taken, you know, keeping up with the Joneses to the point where we now need a new word to describe it is social media. Because if you think about, you know, when I had my FOMO back at, at in business school, believe it or not, and I, for those of you in college, you're going to, now you're going to think I'm a thousand years old, but um, we didn't have social media. Okay. So like while I was inventing FOMO, Mark Zuckerberg was actually one mile away across the river at Harvard Yard coming up with the first version of the facebook.com, right? He actually rented my friend's apartment over the summer didn't clean it and then got in a fight with my friend. So it's, it's kind of, isn't that crazy? Yeah. I'm always <laughs> yeah, like, it's, crazy. it's like too bad. She was like the undergraduate. He's such a slob and like, I mean, he's incredible. Um, <laughs> so, so we didn't have that, but we didn't need it because we were living on top of each other. It was easy to compare ourselves to others. And a big part of FOMO is when we compare ourselves to other people. So now because of social media, you don't have to be on a college campus or in business school or a place like that where you're all on top of each other to compare yourself with other people. I can go on your, like, right, Antonio, I can go on your Instagram. I'm sure your Instagram mm -hmm. is awesome. And then I can be like, man, his life is so much cooler than mine. His yeah. friends are so cool. Like, wow, I took it. Wow, he lives in Spain. Like, all the food's better than America. And I could feel FOMO. <laughs> and when do you think that FOMO gets to the extent that it's uh, harming you? When is it actually toxic to have so much FOMO? Yeah. So the pathology is created when we are living so disconnected from our reality that we begin to sort of. Uh, no longer value what we truly have. So if I spend so much time focused on you, and by the way, you're, I, you're, I'm sure you got filters on there. It's not like your life is perfect. It's that photo mm -hmm, looks mm -hmm. great, but like two minutes later, for all I know, you know, you, you fell down and you know stubbed your toe. I don't know. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. right. We all put the the the, the lenses and, uh, of perfection on the things that we do, and, and and so that. But when I look at that, if I then start to think that that is better than my life, and I start to think, well, my life isn't very good, and I don't appreciate what I have, the the problems begin, and so the the effects of that are a bunch of things. Number one, there are real mental health effects, real um, issues with self-esteem and feeling inferior to others. Number two, uh, FOMO causes us to check our phones way too much. So there's a whole productivity issue around the fact that, you know, the average person spends hours on their phones. Average is like three hours a day, but right now during pandemic, people are on their mm. phones more than ever, right? I mean, my screen time, I looked at it, it's doubled since pre-pandemic times. Um, and then third, uh, is the fact that uh, it's interesting. There's stats out there. There's a study done by Charles Schwab that something like 60% of Americans spend too much money because of FOMO. They buy things they don't need because they see these things. And so, or they invest in things they don't understand. People buy mm -hmm. the Bitcoins and have no idea why they're doing it. And if you, if you Google Bitcoin and FOMO, you get a million hits. So those are the problems that we see mm -hmm. with, with FOMO. So it could harm you financially, um, emotionally, psychologically. And what can we do to fight back? What can we do so we don't have to suffer from all this FOMO? Yeah, so we can do this. And, and that's really what the book Fear of Missing Out is all about. But I'll give you some preview because, um, because it would take me like 17 hours to give you all my theories, even though <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's a pretty quick read. But, but there's a, the, the, Let's go back to the definition because the way to beat FOMO is to attack it at its roots, right? So definition of FOMO is anxiety produced by the perception that something better is happening out there than what you're doing right now. Perception. The mm -hmm. second is that it's a, it's, a, it's a fear of being excluded from the crowd, from some beneficial experience that's collective in nature. So we got to look at each of those. And if we can overcome each of those, then we'll be in the right place. So with the perception question, it's like this is aspirational kind of like it's like mm -hmm. you know i i see something and i want it for me the problem there is that many many times perception and reality are completely separate and so perception is deception right 
there's this great story I read in the paper <laughs> about this is so ridiculous. There's an Instagram like there was a there's a lake in Russia that people like to take pictures in front of for Instagram. Okay. And it's beautiful, right? It's like perfect. And they do yoga. They're doing like their their like tree pose or they're meditating <laughs> or whatever, you know, people do. It's like super extra and they're like Lululemon and <laughs> and um, you know, it turns out it's actually a toxic lake. And if you go in the lake, the people who win, there's like four people who win and they ended up in the hospital. Wow. But when you see it online, it looks so great. And so we have to do that with everything. When you see that thing that makes you feel the FOMO, you have to critically question and investigate and uncover what's really happening there. That's part one. Part two is this fear of being excluded, right? And there it's about motivation. So when you feel the FOMO, you have to ask yourself, is this like is this something I really want to do or am I doing it because I'm being a follower? And who wants to be a follower? Like the whole point why we're all here on this earth is to cut our own path. And so if you're doing things based on guilt or because somebody else looks cool or whatever, um, you know what stinks about that? Um, it's, it's terrible because you spend time and energy living somebody else's dream instead of going out and living your own. And so that's really important. Now, there's a caveat to all this, which is that there is an upside to FOMO. So I'm not, you know, I'm not mm -hmm. all negative on the FOMO. And, and the, that's the fact that when we listen to our FOMO and we look at it critically and we pay attention to it, we might actually find out like, for example, if I go on your Instagram and I'm like, God, Spain looks amazing. You know, maybe mm -hmm. I'll go there and check it out. Right. So we can learn things that we might want to do. Um, but again, we still need to be critical about like, is this just like, you know, why say I couldn't afford to go to Spain or, or say I have FOMO about Spain right now. Right. I can't go to Spain right now because we're all under a quarantine. What's the point of the FOMO? You know, it's not even possible. Mm -hmm. So you, that's the, the critical thing about this. And I think that your previous book, The 10% Tem Entrepreneur, and this new one could uh, also help you understand why you're feeling this FOMO and with The 10% Entrepreneur, approaching it in a way that you don't have to change your life in order to meet, in order to do what you really want to do. Precisely. So the point of the 10% entrepreneur, and it ties in exactly with the new book, um, the 10% entrepreneur was about how to basically, I didn't know it was about this at the time per se, but it was about overcoming entrepreneurship FOMO. Like I want to be an mm -hmm. entrepreneur, but you know, I'm telling people what I wanted people to take away was like, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you don't have to quit your day job. You can start on the side and then see where things go from there. And so that's the whole point of the book. The new book where I talk about FOMO, it's not just about entrepreneurship. It could be anything. Say you want to learn a language, say you want to start a nonprofit, say you want to get involved in politics. I want people to listen to their FOMO and then attack it in a, in a thoughtful way and maybe even benefit from it. And, you know, sort of, but not just sort of pining. There's two bad things that can happen. Number one is you spend your whole life yearning and never do anything, which is so lame. Like who wants to live like that? <laughs> or the number two is that you chase after everything without ever having a focus and then you achieve nothing. So I'm trying to give you the third path where you can have what you want, but do it in a smart way. Doing it incrementally, especially now since uh, all the barriers to entry to entrepreneurship, podcasting, basically, I feel like almost to everything have gone down so much and it's so easy to do both things at once if you could just find that little bit of time. Exactly. Look, 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 let's look at you, right? So you've got this podcast. So how much money did it take you to get this podcast going? No, not no money at all. Exactly. And you're <laughs> and you're and you're meeting people and you're learning stuff and you know it's like now we know each other. I started a podcast like 4 years ago. It cost no money to do it. Um, you know, I, it's like I bought some equipment, that's all. And now today my <laughs> podcast is like in the top 50 business podcasts and, Amazing. and I never spent any money. So it's crazy. <laughs> so there, you know, we can do these things, right? It just, it's about breaking the mold, thinking differently and being creative. And something I think that's really important too, is being decisive, having that, uh, focus, doing the techniques that you mentioned in order to have clear decisions and not be worried that the decision you made is maybe the wrong one or keep dwelling on other decisions that you could have made. So what can people do to build this, um, um, this skill that is uh, making decisions and not dwelling on uh, 
other alternatives. Yeah. So that really comes into the FOBO, right? And FOBO, so you think about it, when you have a fear of a better option, like say you're trying to decide um, you're in recruiting and coming out of college and you got some jobs that you're trying to decide between and you're kind of stuck. You have like three offers and you can't decide. Okay. And so, and there's, by the way, there's going to be more recruiting later on. So you're like, well, maybe I should keep, you know, interviewing for Mm -hmm. jobs for a while more. That's a classic FOBO situation, right? The problem is, and I put this story in the book, which is like, it's a great story. And this is a friend of mine. I had to like kind of anonymize it and hide it because I too, too crazy. I have this friend who basically wanted to move jobs and he applied for, he basically like, let's just say he was at, you know, I'm, I'm going to make it up an example here because um, I'm trying to hide his identity, but say he's at <laughs> Google, right? And he wants, he wants to move, he's in New York and he wants to move to California. And so he, he calls his friends and he says, listen, I want a job in California, ideally San Francisco, but I'll take LA. LA is great too. And he gets a job, an awesome job in LA, like perfect job, perfect opportunity. And it's like exactly what he's wanted. But then he gets that job offer. They send him the email and he forwards it to some friends. And he says, Hey, you know what? I got this offer. Can anybody help me find something like this in San Francisco? I have like a week. But what the guy actually did was he actually responded back to the person who'd made him the job offer by accident. And so he wakes up in the morning and he gets his email and says, uh, you have 24 hours to accept this. Right. So, <laughs> so, so, so ridiculous. Now there's a lot more to the story. I wish I could tell you in real life, but, um, but you get the, you get, the, I think there was some alcohol involved there. Like, I think the person was at the world cup at the time. You know what I mean? Oh. So like, there's a lot more to the story. Like it could be its own book, but what is the takeaway? The takeaway is when we have FOBO, we have a perfectly acceptable option, but we keep fishing for more to try to optimize. And so when you do that, you can actually end up in a situation where you lose the thing that you, you know, you got an option that may go away and which is almost what happened to him. So what I encourage people to do is be very careful about thinking about your criteria. And when you get something that meets it, don't be afraid to take it because the problem when you have FOBO is you're not, well, it's like that song by Ariana Grande, thank you next. It's like you have to say thank you and then get to the next thing. And when you have FOBO, you don't do that. You keep going around the same thing. So it's about getting over risk aversion, accepting the fact that there's no perfect decision. And if something meets your needs, you have to go for it. And is this problem of FOBO somehow also fueling narcissism? Are people that uh, have FOBO, do they have like this narcissistic qualities? Yes, that's a great <laughs> observation. Um, so here's what happens. Like, uh, okay, and I'm not going to pick up. I don't want to pick on like Brad Pitt, but and I'm sure he's <laughs> super nice and not a narcissist. But let me let me show you how how it goes down. Imagine like Brad Pitt, young Brad moves to Hollywood. Like he's going out on auditions, like and he gets an Arby's commercial, and he's just like, I- I'll do any commercial. I'll do Arby's. You want me to do like Burger King? I'm there. Like he's got FOMO. He'll take anything he can get, right? And then, you know, he gets successful. He does like, you know, all the stuff. He's in like the fight club and, you know, all the other stuff he's been in. (laughs) And now he's kind of like, well, you know, I'm only going to look at movies that are important to me and where I can win an Oscar. You know, that's the, now there's nothing wrong with having criteria, but criteria, but he could get into the place where he has FOBO. It's like, he's always waiting for the perfect role so that he can win the Oscar or whatever. Um, That's how it is with the narcissism. It's like the more successful and wealthy we become, the more people offer us things and the greater the temptation to just wait around and wait for something better before we choose something because, oh, guess what? Everybody's offering me something and I'm going to like, you know, that friend who on Friday night, they won't commit until the last minute to go to dinner with you. That is what's going on. That's the narcissism. And then what they don't realize is that by doing this, all of a sudden they could uh, not have all those opportunities and then they could be trying to get back that old opportunity that they passed away. But because of they're in a moment of uh, having a lot of recognition, maybe they have a lot of money, but when they're in a, in a downturn in their lives where they need this compassion, it's not going to be there for them. Totally. People remember, right? I mean, listen, maybe people will be super nice and, and just be good human beings, but but I can tell you, I've had certain friends who, or people I've worked with who had a lot of FOBO and made, inconvenienced me, right? 
made me do unnecessary work for them. It's like, oh, can we change the presentation? I want all the, I want it to be blue now instead of red. It's just like, mm-hmm. why? You know, like there goes my weekend, <laughs> right? Or, yeah. Right. Or, or they don't commit. I had a, a friend and I hope you're listening to this. Um, <laughs> You know, what I'm t- you know what I'm talking about. Who <laughs> literally, we had a guy's trip scheduled to go to Buenos Aires. Okay. And um, the week before, we found out he had also made a, tr- a, pl- a, tra- a plan to travel with his girlfriend at the same time. And he had also scheduled a work trip at the same time. So he had three <laughs> things. It was ridiculous. And, and when we realized that, actually, when we realized that, two things happened. Number one is I. it really made me sort of never rely on that person again. Number two is that I used the guilt to get him to give me a voucher to upgrade to first class. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how can you help one of your friends that you notice has a lot of FOBO and you want to help them? It's like, yo, you shouldn't be doing this because this is wrong. Well, what can you do? What I did for this friend was actually I wrote this book <laughs> and gave it to him. <laughs> but what you can do, you don't have to write a book. You can, you can give my book, but what you can do, th- no, this is super important because it's so annoying. And what happens, people with FOBO who tr- who do these kinds of things, yes, it's really selfish and terrible, but also we have to have a little sympathy because like it sucks to live that way. It's not a good mm-hmm. life. Like living like that is horrible. And you, you basically um, ruin all of your relationships. And so what I do with people like that, and I've done this all the time. I do this now because like I feel very comfortable doing it. Is I, for example, I had a recent thing where we were trying to meet up. I was trying to meet up with two people for um, drinks or something. And you can do this. I mean, this is a social example. You can do this in any aspect of life. Um, and, you know, it was like this thing where we kept on rescheduling and rescheduling. It was like we were on the fourth time around. And so I then they said, uh, one of the people said, okay, well, you know, I think maybe tomorrow works. Let me get back to you tomorrow and let you know. And I said, actually, can you let me know by five o'clock today? And then we'll know. And so basically, what you have to do is give people boundaries. And then you have to accept that they, you know, no matter what happens that you have a plan. Like I was like, I'll meet with the other person anyway, but like you basically have to only deal with these people in ways that are acceptable to you. And you have to give them clear boundaries in which to operate. And I really want to touch on uh, this techniques that you have on being more decisive of uh, sort of prioritizing what decisions are important, what decisions aren't. And maybe you could talk about also the watch technique, which I found to be pretty amazing. <laughs> I'm glad you use it now. <laughs> yeah, I've used it. I've uh, used it. Amazing. It's like the coin, but uh, but it has a lot more options. You could do as many as you want. Basically. Exactly. That's <laughs> exactly right. So yeah, so I did this video for Ted called "How to Make Faster Decisions." And so if there's anything here that you know you want to follow up on, you can watch that. It's 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 got the whole thing. But basically, what I what I've come to believe and what I do in my own life and having done a bunch of research around this, the science supports is that if you want to make decisions to be decisive, you have to simplify and you have to find ways to move quickly. And so I have determined that there are really only three types of decisions in life, high stakes, low stakes, no stakes, high stakes decisions are the one where, you know, you're going to spend the time and energy. And those, um, you know, are things that will have real impacts financially on your life in the medium to long term, you know, they're the things that matter. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, low stakes decisions are things you probably won't remember having decided in a month. Things like, you know, it's like the really innocuous stuff, but it matters. You need criteria. You don't want to just do anything, but things like, you know, which printer should we buy? Which Mm -hmm. uh, hotel between these three should we choose? Things like that. I mean, they matter, but like, not worth a ton of time. And then the no stakes decisions are things you won't even remember having decided a week. Like, tell me what you had for lunch last Thursday. You couldn't tell me. I mean, you'd have to really think about it. And maybe at the time, you spent a lot of time thinking about it. And so, listen, this is how it works. Basically, with the low stakes and no stakes, I have the strategy that is about outsourcing. So, with a no stakes decision, uh, you know, we make these all the time without having any issues. But when you get stuck, and there are people who are very prone to getting stuck. It's like you could spend 15 minutes deciding whether you're going to wear the blue shirt or the white shirt. And it doesn't matter. Really doesn't matter. So what I do and what I recommend you do is something I call ask the watch. So say you're down to, you know, you got two shirts, blue or white. 
The left side of your watch is blue. The right side is white. You look down at your watch, see where the second hand is. Your decision is made. You can flip a coin. You can look at your cell phone if it's even or odd. The watch is great because you could do like up to, you know, you can do quadrants or eighths and stuff like that. But really what you're doing is just you are the one who's injecting the drama into this decision making process. You got to take yourself out of it. And just make it get the decision made. Now, with the sh- with the sort of low stakes, which is the stuff that has more criteria, what I do is outsource to somebody else. So, like, say Antonio, like I'm coming to Madrid. We're gonna meet up. We're gonna, you know, I'm gonna say, you know what, Antonio, I'm. Uh, can you let's let's go somewhere that is, um, you know, m- you know, reasonably priced and there's Japanese food. I wouldn't do Japanese food in Spain, obviously. I'd say no. Where has good tortilla española, reasonable price in this area? You choose. I don't worry about it. I'm not going to do the research. I'm not going to optimize. I'm just going to let you deal with it. So that's what I do. I make very few. When I get stuck now, I outsource everything. Much better way to live. And for the high stakes decisions, you have like this five step process. Could you also like dive deep on that one too? Yeah. So the high stakes decisions, like for example, um, which of these... Uh, like for, you know, I think a college student example could be something like, you know, which of these uh, summer internships should I take, right? I've got like four different ones that I'm talking to or I've got offers, right? That would be awesome if you did. That's pretty good. <laughs> but yeah. it's really hard to choose. I, and I, one of my friends right now is in, is in graduate school and went through this. We use this process. so I know it works. So here you have FOBO. Because you maybe you want to keep looking and or maybe they kind of all seem the same to you. And one is a little better than the other. You're not sure and you're stuck. Oh, and I, I know I've lived this, so I get it. And so here you want to you wanna choose the best thing. That's where the FOBO is coming in. But uh, you, you don't know which one it is. You can't quite decide. Well, the good news is that maximization isn't actually the problem here. It's okay to want the best. Lots of very successful people wanted the best. Like Steve Jobs wanted the best. He still decided, right? The problem you're having is it's your process. Your process is broken. And so you need to fix that. So what you need to do is number one, set some criteria. What is important to you? Have priorities. Number two, you want to research the options deeply and make sure you understand how they map to the priorities, right? Do as much work as you can. Talk to people. Go out. You know, don't just Google search your answers, right? Like Google is like the starting point, not the ending point. Then once you get there, anything that didn't meet your criteria gets thrown, you know, thrown to the curb. And then you get down, say you have three left. Uh, what you want to do then is here, the part that's so important is your process is broken because we get stuck when we keep going back to the same things without eliminating anything, right? That's where the pathology is. So what you want to do is of the three that are left over, you select one, a front runner. It can be any of them, but maybe there's one you're like, eh, I don't know, maybe that's a little better. Okay. You got that one over here. Then you have the other two. You choose one of them. You compare head to head with the front runner and you force yourself to choose one. Okay. And the other one is gone forever. Because that's the critical thing. You cannot have everything. You must, when you choose one thing, you must let go of the rest. So you do that again until you get down to one final one and your decision is made. And if you get stuck, you can always bring in other people and you know, sort of have them vote a uh, small group of people to break the tie. Now, why is it okay to do that, right? Some of you, I, I can hear it in your head. I, right now, you're like, what? Well, I wouldn't, it's crazy. What is this guy talking about? Here's why. By definition, when you have FOBO, the, they're totally acceptable options. You just can't decide. So you are the problem here, not the options. And you've got to take yourself out of it. And so that's what you do. And the great news is, I, I tell you to write this all down so you can go back and check and learn from what you did. But the great thing about it is the more you do this, it's like anything else. Um, it's like any sport or any language or any anything else we learn, um, you get better. Yeah, I think that's great. And aligning it with your values i feel like it's the most important thing but these are also problems of abundance and uh, your first step i feel was the best one that you have to be grateful that you have these choices because most people don't have these choices yeah it's so true and i put in the book and and i talk about a lot i had this experience i went to some syrian refugee camps and in Lebanon, on like near the Syrian border. And I saw it was the first place I'd been in a long time where there was no FOBO because people don't have options. They just don't. They're stuck. They are stuck and they're looking to move on with their lives, but they can't right now. And right now in quarantine, a lot of us are, our FOBO has gone down because we have less options right now. But here's the thing about gratitude that is so critical. Like, and I'm not one of these new agey people. I really am not. It's like, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 people should do, that's fine for some people. It's just not who I am. 
But I would say, I think about gratitude as like stretching before you go for a run. Like if you stretch appropriately, the run is going to be good. You can really like, you know, tear, tear up some pavement. If you are grateful when you go into a decision, you're warmed up to be able to feel good about what the outcome is. And so I, I really like that sort of way of thinking about how you can integrate grateful sort of mindset into your decision making. And also being grateful after you've already made the decision. It's like, okay. And trusting yourself not to dwell back. I feel it's really important. Yeah. Regret is so, I don't like regret. I think regret's a really, really bad thing. Um, I think it serves us um, in so much as if we hurt somebody or ourselves and we have regret, then we can not do that again. But regretting the road not taken. I mean, we all are going to have, I've, I've had you know, examples of like when friends invited me to work in their startups or something that became like unicorns. And I'm like, you know, okay. But you know, you don't know, I could have gone to work <laughs> in this unicorn and then if it, it failed, or maybe I wouldn't have done well there or, you know, whatever it is, like you, you cannot know that. What, what I like to do is invest in other people's things so I can at least be a part of it, but you can't do it all. You can't get them all right. And therefore, um, spending time regretting. I mean, have you ever read that book, um, Great Expectations? Uh, there's the Miss Havisham who her wedding doesn't happen and she spends the rest of her life wearing her wedding dress without leaving her house. <laughs> like, do you really want to be Mrs. Havisham? That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree. And I also want to talk about how companies, how uh, startups have used these terms, FOMO and FOBO, to drive people to buy, to drive sales. Yeah. So they're both quite uh, popular. And in fact, FOMO is used a lot in advertising. And so people talk about it very openly. And there's a there's friends of mine that I've met actually through, I just reached out to them. They're called FOMO bones. It's actually <laughs> dog bones that have CBD in them. Wow. Right? So your dog doesn't wait by the door because he's, he's, <laughs> he's high or whatever. <laughs> you know, so awesome. Uh, he's super relaxed, I should say. And actually, I, I reached out to them when I heard about their company and we're going to have them on the podcast because I just thought they were, it was cool. Um, but FOMO is what, think about when you go on um, like any website, but like, you know, say the airline website or the hotel website, they're always like, last four rooms, you know, <laughs> like don't miss out. You know, that's what they're saying to you. And they're using FOMO to get you to do something, to get you to click. On the FOBO side, I had this really cool conversation with this guy called Sam Shank. Sam Shank was the CEO or of, of Hotel Tonight, which is acquired by Airbnb. And they're uh, an app that's designed expressly for millennials because millennials are indecisive and they want to move quickly, right? That's the, the viewpoint. I'm not criticizing millennials, but I love millennials. But, but there is a consumer behavior around like indecision. It's just part of life. And, and also a desire to move quickly and, and not have things overcomplicated. So Hotel Tonight gives you like a small group of options, like nine or 10 options for a city. If you say you're going to Miami, okay, 10 options, great. Well, what they found in their research is they looked at user, uh, user activity was that, um, was that even though they had this special user experience, like people still had massive FOBO. And so what they did was create this thing called the daily drop. And daily drop is like an offer you get every day like I go into Miami, it drops down. It's like you have 15 minutes to buy this thing and it's gone forever, right? And they and so what they found in the data was that people either bought right away or in minute 14 and um, that their conversion rates were significantly higher. And so when they put it out, actually, they said, this is the ultimate tool to beat FOBO. So they actually, they, they kind of were very straightforward about it and it works. So you can do that in your own business. I mean, you think about how employers give people um, exploding offers. That's a FOBO killer right there. And so there's ways to do that on both sides of the table, but just you, you want to kind of be on the lookout and, and know what's happening so that you can be best prepared to sort of respond. And I think I live in Spain, so they always talk about Sarah in the text. I think they've exploited this the right way because in Sarah, they change uh, their clothes like every week and it's very scarce or whatever. People have to constantly go to see what's there. So I feel like they've created the perfect uh, space for FOMO and for FOBO. Totally. All the fast fashions like like Zara and, and Massimo Dutti and like uh, Uniqlo, they do a really, because they're, yeah, it's like you, if you don't come in right now and check every week, you're going to miss out on this thing. It's going to be gone forever. So the, it's, a, it's a very smart strategy. That, that's excellent. And I think 
we've covered a lot. I'm uh, really happy with this interview. Is there anything else you'd like to say or anything that you'd like to promote? Yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted. Well, first of all, it's super fun being here. And um, I love that you guys have started this podcast. It's great. Number two is I, you know, people are interested in, in connecting with me. So the best place to find me is at my website, patrickmcginnis.com. That's M-C-G-I-N-N-I-S. Check out my podcast, FOMO Sapiens, distributed by Harvard Business <laughs> Review. And uh, FOMO Sapiens is like my life at this point. But uh, I have on kind of entrepreneurial thinkers. So people, every, I've had everybody from like Andrew Yang, the presidential candidate, to CEOs of major corporations like Chobani. Um, and and Zola to like I had a twelve year old kid on one time, which is wow. really cool. Um, and experts in digital wellness and productivity. So it's really um, it's a show about how entrepreneurial thinkers make their choices they do and how we can learn from them. And then the new book is called Fear of Missing Out: Practical Decision Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice. You can find it at your booksellers. It'll be on um, it's on Amazon around the world. It's coming out in a bunch of different languages in the next year or so. So if you live in Latin America or you live in Asia, you'll find it there. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, Instagram is um, my, I think my Instagram is pretty good. It's FOMO inducing. Uh, so it's uh, <laughs> Patrick J. McGinnis, Patrick J. McGinnis. <laughs> well, thank you, Patrick. It's been an honor and um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for watching this episode of the Rebound Talks podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. We're coming out with episodes every single Wednesday. So please subscribe. Leave a like and if you found anything useful, comment it down below. See you next week.